Well, hello, Connection Point. Uh, Happy Palm Sunday. This is a special day, just really actually in history, certainly biblical history. It marks the beginning of Holy Week. And some 2,000 years ago, Jesus rode in uh, to Jerusalem on a mission uh, to lay his life down. And so what we remember today starts with him uh, in this triumphal entry, and it ends in a really unexpected manner for the people uh, that were expecting something entirely different from Jesus. Uh, the week ends with his death, but then his resurrection. And so we've got Easter to look forward to in the coming weeks. Welcome if you're uh, at one of our locations, Fishers, Avon, hello, hi, we love you. If you're part of the online family, same to you. We're super thankful for just being able to gather together in worship today. So um, we're wrapping up this series called My Deepest Needs. And we've spent a few weeks just examining some of the deepest needs that we've got, the soul level needs, those deep spiritual needs that we have, and really finding that our Heavenly Father is the source of meeting all of those needs. We've learned that we're accepted. We've learned that we have a need for a identity, identity change to be his beloved one. Uh, we've learned that we can declare some things that are true, that help us close the gap between what we lack and what our Heavenly Father wants to provide and is able to provide for each of us. And as we kind of land the plane today, I would like to talk to you about the need for rest. This is a huge need that all of us have, both physical rest and deep spiritual rest. And it's also a thing that is God's biggest gift to me and you. He has provided permission for you to rest on a regular basis. Hello, did you know that? God has given you permission for that. But then he's also made a way, he's made it possible for you to find soul level rest, spiritual rest, and rest that will actually last for all of eternity. I'm thankful for that because I'm a fan of rest. I'm a fan of the nap, champion napper right here. I, uh, I'm not a fan of physical exertion <laughs> at all, none of it. I don't like physical exertion. You know, you know you're extra mellow and not physically active when you can't even sit through watching someone else play sports. I can't tell you how many sporting events that I have fallen asleep right in the middle of. I'm not in good shape then. I went to an indoor arena football league. And if you have never been to one of these, I mean, you're, you're tight in there. They're playing tackle football. We had really good seats right up front. I mean, so close where you could feel the spray of the sweat on you. I'm sitting there watching these guys and they're tackling hard and they're running hard and they're jumping and all this activity. And all I could think about was, my goodness, this folding chair that I'm in <laughs> is the worst. A guy literally blew out his knee right in front of me. And all I was thinking was, man, this is the worst chair I have ever sat in. I'm not going to make it. I don't like physically exerting, which is why probably like some of you, I can, I can doom scroll through Netflix for like an hour and a half and never land on a show. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> when you've made your way down through the Netflix categories that no one's ever heard of before, it starts with dramas and comedies and ooh, 80s movies. And then you're down to like submarine movies starring an all canine cast. You're like, what is this? This is, <laughs> I'm lost now. I have some ability naturally to rest physically. But what's way harder for me is to kind of rest in my heart. To get my mind to rest. To find that deep soul level rest. And yet God has an interest to provide both, both physical rest for me and you, as well as a deep physical soul level rest. 
And, and he, he is the source of that rest. We need to look to him for that sort of rest because if we don't, we're missing one of his biggest gifts and we'll go through this life striving for all the wrong things. We'll go through this life wiped out and exhausted. Do you know that the universe really was built around rest? Our universe is built around rest, built by God himself, created by God, who six days of creation, what happens on the seventh day, God rested. Genesis chapter two tells us that. And he rested not because he was tired, but because he was gonna model for me and you how important rest is, how special rest is. And so God rested, giving us an example to follow. And then in Exodus, we get the Ten Commandments. And in Exodus chapter 20, one of the Ten Commandments from God is the Sabbath. It's a regular part of the week that he gave to the people of God to to build into their weekly rhythm a time where they would shut off and shut down and be quiet and be still and rest from their labors because they needed physical rest. But also the intent was to remind the people of God that they're not God. And there's nothing like rest to cease from your labors to kind of reorient the universe Reminding yourself, okay, I am a human and I am in need of rest. And I'm going to rest now physically, but in that regular rhythm, what God was also intending was to point us to a deeper rest, not just physical, but one that's needed in our soul. You know, the Israelites were held captive in Egypt as slaves for some 400 years God delivers them from slavery and sends them on a journey to the promised land. That actually took place. It's also a picture of what we are in right now. Without God, we're slaves to sin. And through Jesus, he's come to rescue us out of slavery to sin. And we're on this journey to eternal rest in paradise with him forever. Amen. Right on. Woohoo. I can't wait for that. But in the meantime, we got a journey. In the meantime, uh, we've got a lot of work. We've got responsibilities. We've got stuff to do. In the Old Testament, God provided rest for Israel through Joshua. And, And Joshua is the one that leads the people of God into the promised land. Joshua is the same name as Jesus. And so that's a picture of what Joshua did literally to provide physical rest for the people of God. Jesus came to do to provide deep soul rest for all people who would put their faith and trust in him. And in Hebrews chapter 4, it starts to point to, hey, the rest that was provided to the people of God when they hit the actual promised land to provide physical rest for them, that wasn't the end. There's this whole other rest, a deeper rest that God's got. Hebrews 4 verse 9 says, so there is a special rest or a Sabbath rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. See, when we start to slow down physically and we build that rest into our regular routine, we can catch our breath. And that's good for our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health. But when we slow down in a regular pattern, it's also meant to point us back to God in the space that our work is taking up and our worry is taking up. We can come to Jesus. We can return to the Lord. We can think on him. We can meditate on him. We can listen to him. If we'll just turn down the volume on the ambient noise of our life and crank up the volume on what God has to say, 
When we practice that regular rest, it was always meant to point us to a deeper rest that's needed. The problem is angsty hearts don't rest well physically either. A lot of times, if we're all turbulent inside, we keep so busy outside so as to never have to think about what's going on in here. And the cycle kind of perpetuates itself. And Jesus is saying, I got rest for you physically, but I've also got rest for your heart. I've got rest for your soul. See, God invites me and you to rest regularly from our actual work and then to rest always from trying to work our way into his good graces. The physical rest, it's important And he asks us to do it, rest, slow down. But then he's really using that to point us to a rest that's always available from like striving to be worth something, striving to please him, striving to measure up. We need some rest. Anybody need rest? Yeah, Fishers, you need rest? Avon, you need rest. Online family, you need rest. Yeah, I need rest. I jotted down some things that I could use some rest from. See if any of these resonate with you. (laughs) It's a lot. Maybe need rest from the workload. Rest from the family load. Rest from the school load. Rest maybe from a ministry load that you carry. Maybe rest from the cultural noise. How about rest from all the media noise? How about rest from the global noise? Rest maybe from health concerns? Rest from financial concerns, how about that? Rest from political concerns? Rest from hurts around the world? Rest from maybe impressing others all the time? A rest from measuring up. A rest rest from meeting standards constantly. How about a rest from gossip? How about a rest from relationship issues? A rest from hiding stuff? A rest from temptations? A rest from sin? How about a rest from the fear of rejection or rest from the fear of failure? How about a rest from faking it? What about a rest from constantly feeling like you're disappointing God? What about a rest from beating yourself up? How about a rest from doing enough For God. What about a rest from always trying to earn God's love? And honestly, this is probably just the beginning, isn't it? There's a lot of things we need rest from. Some on a physical level. Some on a mental level. Some on an emotional level. Some on a relational level but many of which are on a deep heart level, a soul level, a spiritual level. Now, the beauty it is, is there's an invitation. And the invitation to rest from all of this load is to come to, come to God for your rest. You wanna rest from, then come to. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah, In Isaiah chapter 30, verses 15, verse 15, it says, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, look, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. (laughs) Sound familiar? This has been a problem for a long time for all sorts of people, and yet we'd be stuck, but we're not, because look at verse 18. It says, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. 
We're exhausted. We got a lot of stuff to rest from. And sometimes we can't even get the strength to come to him for the rest. Praise God. He comes to us. This echoes for me similar to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 in the New Testament. Jesus said this, Matthew 11, familiar to a lot of you. Come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you, what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you. Now, a yoke is a farming implement, a farming tool that would, it would shackle instruments uh, of, of uh, like towing, basically, uh, so that they could pull heavy things through a field or whatever. They'd link two animals together with a yoke, and they would pull the heavy load. The cool part about it, though, was they would always put the stronger, smarter, more experienced animal with the new animal. They would yoke those together. So when Jesus says this, all the farmers are going, yeah, I'm familiar with the yoke, and I'm familiar with how it works. But I think there would have been some encouragement, too, because in this illustration from Jesus... Between us and Jesus, which one is the stronger, smarter, more experienced creature? It's not me. And we're yoked together with him. And he says, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. So you want to rest from all this stuff? Then come to him. Jesus is God in the flesh. And so it's really rather than striving as our focus, resting should be our focus. Rather than striving in all the work, all the labor that we do, The invitation from God is, come to me and rest in what I have already done for you and what I will do for you and what I want to provide for you. He's already done a bunch for us with regard to our salvation. And then he's still with us, walking with us. He's still providing for us. Rest is still found in coming to him. You can rest in him. Well, why is it that you can find rest in God? Well, here's a handful of things. One is because he is never going to add to your list. Other people add to your list. He's never going to add to your stress. He's never going to add to the burdens. Yeah, I might call you to do some things or change some things. But he's never going to contribute to a heavy weight on your shoulders. If you're feeling that from the Lord, then you've missed what it is to really be in relationship with him. It's not about religiosity. It's not about legalism. It's not about following rules. He's invited you into a very restful relationship. And he's never going to add to the hurts. He's never going to add to the cards That's why you can rest in him. What's more, you can rest because he's going to help you through this stuff. When you're resting in him, then he's going to guide you and instruct you through his word. He's going to empower you through his spirit. He'll help you through it. That's why you can rest in him. He's a help. And you can also rest because his work takes the place of your work, especially when it comes to salvation. So you can't work your way into his good graces. There's no amount of good stuff that you could do to earn God's love or favor. That's why he sent Jesus. To do something, accomplish something for us on the cross, through the cross and the resurrection that we could never work for ourselves. And so, because of the person and the work of Jesus, not because of you, not because of how good you are, not because of how diligent you are 
only because of Jesus and the cross and your faith in him, you can rest because of that. You can rest because of what he has done on the cross for you. And in that regard, here's our load. And we could just turn to Jesus and leave that load at his feet. You can rest in him. I feel particularly wired to uh, work, especially when it comes to um, pleasing people. I've been a people pleaser since I can remember. I, I, I don't know a time where it, I wasn't one. And so way back in school, um, I was a straight-A student, not because I was smart, but because I thought people would like me better if I got good grades. And when I started working, then I thought, okay, I'll be the hardest worker, just not because I'm particularly good at working, but because I wanted people to like me and thought they'd like me better if I worked harder. Then I came to Jesus. I came to faith in Christ. And and the same mode of operating and working hard and people pleasing, I found I applied to my faith. Not a great combo. I thought, oh, okay, I know how to perform well. I, I'm familiar with people pleasing. I imagine it's very similar to God pleasing. So quite subconsciously, I thought, okay. Now that I'm a Christian, I know how to play this game. And what, what more could you do as a Christian than go to work for him vocationally? Now, I don't like manual labor and third world country stuff. Blah, so I guess I'm not that great like as a missionary to go overseas. I don't like getting dirty. I don't like all, you know but I'll work for you here stateside, God, and then will you like me? And I was trying to please him that way. It, it would be years before I would connect the dots on really what I was doing. By the time I was in my late 20s, I, I was so exhausted and just burned out, trying to please everybody else, work hard physically. But in my heart of hearts, now I look back and realize I was still trying to earn his love and his favor, and it was exhausting. And then that's when my adoptive dad passed away. Out of the blue, over 20 years ago, he was 48 years old, heart attack, we lost him. And it just crushed me. But what God did in the horrible beauty of that season was he forced me to rest. And it was quite the gift because I didn't have any strength in me to perform any war or work hard again. I, I didn't have it in me, nothing. So I just rested and learned what it was to let him provide for me. It was a defining moment for me. There's one brief defining moment in, in the scriptures I would love to call your attention to as we kind of land the plane today. And it's a moment with the disciple John. John uh, was one of the 12 disciples and he was very close to Jesus, really kind of in the inner three. He was probably the youngest of the disciples. We don't know how exactly old the disciples were, um, but there's a high likelihood that the disciples were teenagers, maybe with the exception of Peter. And John would have been the youngest, so he could have been maybe as young as 13. And he could have been closer to 20. We're not exactly sure. But he records what I believe to be his defining moment in the scriptures. And his defining moment wasn't when Jesus from the cross looked down at John and asked John to take care of his mom, Mary. I don't think that was his defining moment, although that could have been one. I don't think his defining moment was witnessing miracles. I don't think his defining moment was being an eyewitness to the transfiguration. I don't think his defining moment was writing the Gospel of John or the book of Revelation. I think what we're going to look at here for just a moment was his defining moment. 
And it happened at the Last Supper. In John chapter 13, Jesus has just washed his disciples' feet. And then he says that one of them is going to betray him. Look at verse 22. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. Lying back on Jesus' chest was one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's John. So Simon Peter nodded to this disciple and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. He then simply leaned back on Jesus' chest and said to him, Lord, who is it? Okay, picture for just a second. They had tables that were really, really low slung. And when you'd have a meal, the food would be all there. You would actually recline, lay down, head near the table, on an elbow, and recline around the table. So you can picture why it would be easier for basically a young teenager with his spiritual big brother to be kind of leaning back against his chest. But two times in three verses... John wants to let me and you know that he was leaned back against Jesus' chest. See, John wrote this gospel, John, probably some 50, 60 years after the resurrection. So he's a lot older when he's writing this. And as he's reflecting, he, he puts in here two times in three verses Hey, we were all eating a meal, and I was leaned back against the chest of Jesus. And then Peter wanted me to find out what Jesus was talking about. So I got up from Jesus' chest, heard the question from Peter, and then I leaned back against Jesus' chest. He, he wants you and I to know that he was like this. They were close. And if it were just this in this moment, you go, oh, I, maybe that's just coincidental and it doesn't really have any meaning. But then in the last chapter of his gospel, in John chapter 21, verse 20, Jesus is talking to Peter and it says, Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. That's John, the one who also had leaned back on his chest at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who's betraying you? So now three times in his gospel, he's, he's broadcasting. I got to lean back against the chest of Jesus. I think this was his defining moment, as it should be. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine getting to lean your your head against the chest of God so close that you could hear his heartbeat. Man, that would have been something special. That would have been a defining moment. For me, I think it was for John, he calls his, our attention to it multiple times. I think there were three things that leapt off the page for him when he got that intimate experience with Jesus, God incarnate. I think it was defining one because, because now John would really truly know who God is, that he's approachable, that he desires that intimacy, that he is humble and gentle at heart. I think it just spot welded right into his soul, the character and nature of God, that he could lean back against his chest. I think he also learned a whole lot about who he was just as a man, as a friend of Jesus, the beloved one. Because he then gives this title to himself, the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> That's what he describes himself. So he learns a whole lot about who God is. He also learned a whole lot about who he is. How did it happen? Leaning back against the chest. I think John ultimately learned that rest is found in a person, Jesus Christ. Rest is ultimately found in a person, Jesus. Not in just logic. It's not just found in ideas. It's not just found in words. It's found not even just in action. But real rest 
for your soul is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ, one in which you can rest on his chest. And I think a rest on his chest affords us some amazing things like safety and relationship and closeness to his heart. You rest on his chest and you'll feel safe. Because you can't really ever rest, can you, until you feel safe with someone. And so when John's leaned back there, I think he's going, man, I, I feel safe, so now I can really rest in him. That relationship, when you're that close, you think John's just thinking about all the religion and all the stuff he needs to do? No. It's clear he can have a relationship with God. And that came through resting. And I think that closeness to his heart, that's a beautiful thing. Because when your heart and his heart are close and tuned into each other, then you can really be restful. Because you're hearing the right things about him and about you. And about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. It's huge. And Hebrews... Chapter 4, we double back to that passage. Verse 11 says, so let us do our best to enter that rest. Another translation says, make every effort to enter that rest. And so now here's an interesting combination between rest and our effort. See, the rest that God offers me and you, it's always there. But we do have to do our best to enter it. As much as God loves us, he's never going to force you to rest. He's never going to force you to put your head on the chest. I'm a Disneyland kid, grew up about 15 minutes from Disneyland in California. So apologies, I haven't been to Disney World yet. I know that's where all of you go, but um, it's the same. Just, you know, Disneyland's just like a shrink ray to Disney World. But if you've ever been, you you go and this is it. You, You arrive and they take your tickets here at the gate. And then once you get inside the gate, I mean, you start to get excited. But you get inside the gate and there's this courtyard that's quite beautiful. And uh, it stops with the train station and this big flower mound of Mickey's face right there. And the music's playing. And, but it's just a courtyard. And off to the left and off to the right are two tunnels that leads you into the rest of the park where you can go to the Matterhorn or It's a Small World, God forbid, or the Tiki Room or whatever it is. But what if you you got the whole family and you went to Disneyland and you got in through the gate and you get into the courtyard and you know that the, the wonder of all that is Disneyland is just right through those tunnels. But instead you... You stop there in the courtyard and you take your backpack off and you pull out a picnic blanket. You stretch it out right there in the courtyard and invite your family. Hey, well, we made it. Let's have a seat, guys. We're here. And you sit down on the picnic blanket and you pull out snacks that you brought. It's cheaper that way. And you go, isn't this great, guys? We made it. People are walking by going, you know, just through the tunnel is the actual deal. No, we're good. We're inside. So this is all we're going to do. We made it. This is great, right? No, that's not great. It's not great at all. And yet sometimes I feel like we do that with God. The treasure that is resting in God in a relationship with Jesus on a regular basis is such a gift. Why would we settle for just the courtyard of it? Why would we settle for just one time a week of it? Whoa. Why? (laughs) I need a rest right now, apparently. (laughs) Why would we? Why, Why would we keep him at arm's length rather than experience the fullness of what it is to lean back on the chest of Jesus and, and rest there. So practically speaking, real quick, if you want to take some notes that maybe just help you 
learn how to rest in him, I'd encourage you to this. One, you're going to rest in him by taking a break. Two, by removing distractions. Three, by being still. And four, you're going to rest in him by opening yourself to his love. Now, I know it's silly and stupid. I'm going to ask you to participate with me in this. Uh, Here's number one, how to rest in him. Take a break. I want to do hand motions, okay? So take a break. Everybody do this. Break. You don't have to make the sound, but you can if you want to. Feel free. Fishers, I can't hear you. Avon, hello? Online, come on. Break. Take a break. A pastor friend used to talk about uh, divert daily, withdraw weekly, abandon annually. That, that's a good rhythm. Every single day, divert to a place of rest to listen to him and his word, to pray, to be still, divert daily. Withdraw weekly. Find a regular practice, a rhythm weekly for rest, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. God gives you permission for that. And, and then abandon annually. If you got the ability, get away. Shut off for longer than just a half day or a 24-hour period. This is the biblical invitation to vacation. Even if you just don't go to work or whatever, you, you, you take a break. So what's number one? Take a break. Okay. Number two, remove distractions. Let's do this. Swipe. I don't know if it's swipe right or left or whatever. I don't care because that's not what I'm talking about. Swipe. <laughs> Swipe, get it out of there. Remove distractions. Take a break, remove distractions. By that, I mean turn off. Turn what off? Everything. Shut it off. Shut off the phone. Shut off the TV. Shut off the music. Shut off the Wi Fi. (gasps) Do it. Try it. Be still for just like. If that's the longest you've been really still or quiet in a long time, there's a problem. (laughs) Remove distractions. Take a break. Remove distractions. Number three, be still. Prayer hands. (laughs) Be still. Be still. Take a break. Remove distractions. Be still. Slow your mouth. Slow your body. Slow your mind. There's something very biblical about meditating on the word. Stillness, quietness is something that you and I really have to fight for. And I think this is a space that the enemy is owning. And just stilling yourself in quietness and in prayer. And not even to talk yet or ask yet, but just to listen. Be still. Take a break. Remove distractions. Be still. And lastly, open your heart to his love. Put your palms up. Take a break. Remove distractions. Be still. Open up your heart. I I know you love me, Jesus, but I don't feel it right now. Or I don't know if I've ever felt it or I've ever heard it. So... My heart needs to experience your heart. I'm opening it. I'm not going to close it. I'm opening it. I'm not going to harden it. I'm opening it. I'm not going to numb it out with other stuff. I'm opening my heart to what you have to say to me. I'd encourage you to meditate on Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39, every single day for the next two weeks. It's just a handful of verses. Would you do that as you open your heart to his love? Read that. It's the part that says, if God is for us, who can be against us? It closes with, is there anything in all creation that can separate us from the love of God? The answer is no. Meditate on that every single day for two weeks. Take a break. Remove distractions. Be still. Open your heart to his love. If you have a consistent 
heart to heart with God. A consistent one, daily, weekly, where you rest in him. What would you hear? What would he say to you? How would he comfort you? I think if you had that consistent heart to heart with him, he'd remind you a whole lot about who he is. And he'd also remind you of who you are. He would say some very deep things to you. And remind you that he's the source of all these deep things that we desperately need. Whatever location you're at, would you receive this as what God would say to you? As we wrap up this time, I think it would look and sound something like this. So gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for knowing our deepest needs and providing every possible thing that we need on that soul level, that spiritual level. Thank you for providing for needs that we've got here and now and providing a way for us to experience rest beyond comprehension for all of eternity. We thank you for the person and the work of Jesus. Thank you that the invitation is there for us to regularly, consistently, always lean our head against your chest, that you welcome that, you invite that, and you do so much in us when we do that. Thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray.